Good evening, good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me, good evening. Can you hear me well? Okay, lovely. Take a breath. It's been a day. Um, all of us feel so happy that we're together in collective moments. Uh, thank you for joining us for our in conversation series here at CAM. My name is Alexandra Mitchell, and I have the distinct pleasure of serving as the manager in education and public programs here at CAM. We are excited have our James here to work with chef, your current top chef, Judge Harley Mawashi, discusses daily cookbook, My America Recipes, from a young black chef with celebrity chef, the top chef participant, Naisha Arrington. In the book, Mawashi shares the dishes of his America, dishes that show the true diversity of American food, featuring more than 125 recipes, My America, is a celebration of food of the African diaspora as handed down from Owashi's own family history spent in Nigeria to the Caribbean, the South to the Bronx and beyond. So all over, we're so excited to hear about this. In a role throughout the book, our stories of Owashi's travels illuminating the connections between food, place, food, and culture. Some topics of the book are available for purchase directly following this talk if you weren't able to purchase them in advance. And we also hope that you were able to enjoy our Mario Moore exhibition before we start the talk tonight, we'll also be on here after we finish the conversation. This program is presented in partnership with Now Serving, a cookbook and culinary shop here in Los Angeles. And I'd like to send a big thank you to Michelle Blake Mung I'm sorry, Mungo, for all of your help with tonight. We're so excited to partner with you all. Thank you. Uh, Kwame Owashi was born on Long Island and raised in New York City, Nigeria, and Louisiana. Kwame was first exposed to cooking by his mother in the family's modest Bronx apartment. Kwame trained at the Culinary Institute of America and opened five restaurants before turning 30. Can we get a clap for that? One of those restaurants, of course, includes Kip and Kim. Since competing on Top Chef, he has been named one of Food Wine's best chefs. As far as magazines, 2019 Chef of the Year and a 30 under 30 honorary, honorary um, excuse me, honorary by both Zagat and Forbes. Chef Nigel Harrington has been in love with the kitchen since cooking alongside her grandmother at a young age. Born in Southern California, Harrington was introduced to early, early introduced to the diverse foods. Harrington is celebrated for her advocacy of using farm fresh locally and responsibly sourced ingredients and has been featured in the Los Angeles Times, Food and Rhyme, GQ, the Cooking Channel, Essence Magazine, among many others. Additionally, Arrington has headlined the Austin Food and Wine Festival, as well as the Los Angeles Food Bowl, Disney, California Adventure, New York Food and Wine Festival, and was featured on the cover of Rich Ray Every Day, um, Rich Ray Every Day, excuse me, in Delta Airlines Sky Magazine. Today, Arrington owns and operates a full chef consulting and catering business while traveling around the globe for speaking engagements and dinner collaborations. We are so excited to have both of them with us. Please give them a very keen welcome. Cuisine. What can one expect? 
expect to read through and cook through in North America? Um, well, you know, I, I think starting with like the, the idea behind my America, everybody has their own version of what they grew up eating in, in their home. And it's not until you get out of that home and you, you go to a sleepover and you're like, oh wait, why? <laughs> everybody doesn't really like me, you know? And you go to school. Um, and, you know, my America was a celebration of Afro Caribbean cuisine. And when you think of Afro Caribbean cuisine, it really tells the story of our people in general, you know, coming from West Africa to the Caribbean, to the American South. Um, and that's what this book is. It's a, it's a culmination of all those things. And, it's also just as much as a book as it's a cookbook because I get into the stories of the dishes and why this took the test of time. And you know, with this book, I'm trying to give a voice to the audience. Beautiful. Do you have a um, sort of example that I can share before these lovely folks dive into it in their homes and cook through your creations? Um, what maybe are some sort of like pantry staples that people maybe aren't familiar with, like maybe Nigerian cuisine or things that you? keep around at home that uh, a lot of the people should do as well. Yeah, well, the book starts with the pantry. And I think that's like the secret weapon of, of black kitchen, but also just uh, of cultures that, that cook really, really well. Yes. Um, and the pantry allows us to cut so much time out of our cooking processes. So we have these things that we can build the flavors upon. So within this pantry, it's at the beginning of the book. And if you stock your kitchen with that first, with you know ginger garlic puree, with house spice, which is my mom's. My mom's right there, everybody. Can you give it up? Yeah, mom. I actually got that spice and I'm really excited about it. It's good to see. But yeah, this house spice blend, which is like an all-purpose seasoning um, that goes on everything. You know, we have jerk base, you know, in there. Um, I think it's about like 30 different recipes to kind of like build your kitchen and build your arsenal so that you can cook through the book a little more easier. Absolutely. I mean, as chefs, we all know, I mean, the only thing that really separates us from the average home cook is that pantry, right? Like, the average chef's going to have that spice blend, that stock made, that takes that first 20 to 30 percent out of cooking. And, you know, in fancy kitchens, we may call that mix and gloss or pre-preparation, but I think Chef Kwame sort of speaking to that and building that character in your dishes, right? Amazing. Um, just to sort of segue, I think, um, you know, as a world and a society, especially world as a microcosm, um, how would you say, uh, you know, social media, social capital is influencing how we're able to tell our narratives and how we are able to tell these amazing stories through different, a different lens. I think before the old recipe, right, of business was people patron your restaurant, make it a good write-up in the LA Times and the New York Times. And now we have this whole new area of social media things different platforms and I and I ask and pose that question because I see you and I you know I try to stay with you know where you're at in the nation, the city of the globe and it's just such an amazing platform to be able to celebrate. How do you think that's sort of um, changing or influencing the narrative of chefs? It's definitely changing because now everyone has a voice which I think is kind of a double edged sword because everyone has an opinion. Uh, but I think you're able to control your own narrative you know, with the social because it's like you heard me or something? Yeah. We'll just do this. Yeah. All right. That's better? Yeah. Cool. That was fun. <laughs> Sorry. I had to stop three days, so maybe it's just in my head. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, that, you know, we're, we're able to reclaim your narrative with, with this tool. And I think if you use it as a tool, um, it can be super beneficial. You know, you can capitalize on it. Um, you can capture audiences. You can be in control of, of your own story and the way that it is portrayed. So I think it's an important, it's an important vehicle right now that I also think can be abused on the other side of it. Um, so I think people should really take their time before they're you know putting something out there because there's, there's actual people on the other side of that screen. Uh, what can we expect from the Chef Kwame on this amazing? form of literature, your heart and soul in, on these pages. Um, is there anything we can sort of tease out that you're excited about coming up? Uh, I have a movie filming in October. Wow, a movie. Okay, does anyone else hear that? <laughs> Coming out, the, the first book uh, was a 
adapted by A24, and you know they filmed this fall. So I'm really, really excited about that. Um, I have a family reunion, which is a four-day food conference that celebrates Black and Brown contributions to the food industry. It's with Sheila Johnson at Salamander Resort and Spa. You were there last year. It was, it was pretty fun. I would say I think it was 
at the same time, around probably four years old, but I think that's when the brain really starts to develop and you can start to think, you know, these really cognizant thoughts. And I remember specifically the energy that I felt in my grandmother's food is I felt that I knew what love tastes like. You know, that's what I remember, is that I felt nourishment, I felt nothing more than love. And I, and I, and I, was, I can remember that like it was yesterday. You know, and it left such an impact on my life that I think that's ultimately, you know, through self-discovery, after graduating high school, it's like, oh, I want to be a chef, you know, and all throughout that time, I've been cooking, my sister and I, you know, in the home, cooking for my parents. I did soul searching and trying to recreate that for other people, because as chefs, we are, you know, happy to nurture another, you know, it is not an easy business, right? So that drive and that passion has to come from somewhere else other than the tangible things. It has to come from the intangible that lives in our soul, right? That our ancestors give us, you know? And so I think, you know, that it, it wasn't necessarily a specific dish. There were dishes that are very memorable throughout many, my mom, my grandmother, my dad. But I would say the taste of love is like the first visceral memory um, of that experience. What does love taste like? Generally, it's going to be uh, lots of dishes. I um, actually have a sort of mixed background, half green, half black. And, you know, for me, those flavors, like you said, were a flavor explosion, you know. So the banchan, having a, a table full of different dishes, that, that flavor tastes like boiled octopus. You know, as a kid, eating that, you know, being like, okay, I'm supposed to eat this. And it was delicious with the chili sauce. And, feeling like my mouth was on fire, but I couldn't get enough, you know? Yeah. So those flavors just light up my soul, you know, and then eating that crisp cold lettuce and like different things, you know? And then on my mom's side, on my dad, that was my mom's side, my dad's side's from Mississippi, you know? And so I grew up with my aunties cooking, very Southern inspired cuisine, gumbo, you know, like these dishes that we had around family gatherings and Thanksgiving that um, my aunt Linda, you know, she was one of the best cooks in our family. And, um, you know, the, the soul and the memories live in us, right? And you said that, right? What are we without our memories, especially in the digital age, right? We are, life is literally a string of memories that we are able to create and dictate at any moment in time. Absolutely. 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 And your next question. So, no, I will ask you all my questions and you give me short answers. <laughs> so, <laughs> right to the point. I mean. Pardon? So I was getting to the point. Yeah, we love that. Uh, so we're sort of up on your journey of My America, celebrating around the nation. Um, so I'm, I have a party tomorrow, so house, everybody's invited. Yay! Which one? Uh, <laughs> downtown. Like, Dope. Amazing. Downtown Soho. See you tomorrow. Show up, you know. Say my name at the door, I'm pretty sure. Okay. Um, and then I'm going to Houston. Amazing. And uh, then I'm going to Austin. And then New York. Awesome. Very, very cool. So, also, maybe we have some questions from the audience. <laughs> Yay! We have a question up here. Any yes or no questions? It's in, um, it's in Middleburg, Virginia. In Aspen. I'm not sure, but there's a lot of food festivals everywhere, so there probably is one there. But the ones that I usually go to is in Aspen and in the family. Okay. Oh. I was just asking about the food festivals. I had seen one in a food cuisine probably 12 years ago. And I was like, oh, I missed it. But I thought there was one in San Francisco. Yeah, they, they have it everywhere, so I'm pretty sure there's, there's one where you can go. Okay. <laughs> hey, uh, I'm here with my coworkers from the Fuller Youth Institute, and we study young people. So I'd like to ask you, when you were young, 
Um, how did food or cooking, um, how did it shape your sense of identity, belonging, and purpose? That's a deep question. <laughs> <laughs> For me, food, food was like, it was definitely just being green in our family. You know, like everybody knows how to cook, and I come from a long line of restaurant tours and chefs. Um, so, you know, some of my earliest memories were my grandfather was like visiting him on, on a ship in his Navy, like he was a chef there, you know, like so it was always just around and it was something that was like really, really important for us to come together and cook together. When my family comes together, there's prep lists involved, you know, <laughs> everybody has their own dish that they make. Um, and it's the probably like the only time we're not actively trying to kill each other. So it's like it's it's <laughs> for me, like food is, is a huge part of my identity. It's a huge part of like both both sides of the family. You know, my dad's side, I I want to say I went to Nigeria, but I was sitting there with my mom. Um, <laughs> sitting there for two years, um, <laughs> and you know we had to raise our own livestock. You know, cooking was like it was an event. Like we had to go and cut the palm kernels from the tree and process them to make oil. You know what I'm saying? So like. That directly influenced, you know, luckily my, my career path, but it showed me to like appreciate, you know, every second of the and not just where it comes from, but like how it's made and how many people are without it. So food for me, you know, food definitely saved my life, but it was there the whole time. You know, my earliest memories are being in the kitchen, whether I was just a bystander or I was actually helping out. Is that a deep enough answer? <laughs> I'm trying to Make my answer longer. <laughs> hey, 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 Kwame, how you doing? Um, my name is Nick. And another thing. Um, I, I, I want to know what what's your biggest takeaway from creating your first cookbook? And the second part of that would be what was your favorite part on that journey of making this book? So, first question the biggest takeaway from doing the first book, I think it was that like we all have a story and it needs to be told. You know, like we all are just as important as the next one. When I was writing the book, I didn't really know how it was gonna come out. You know, we all like, think about it, we hate, we hate the sound of our own voice, you know what I mean? Like, uh, I'm like, is anyone gonna find this interesting? And people did. And within writing it, I kind of had to relive those moments, even the bad ones again, and it showed me how much you know the journey is to reward out of everything. Um, and for this book, this book was like, because a lot of people ask like how hard was this one recipes. I honestly just thought of everything I ate growing up. And I had like 200 recipes and I had to cut it down. And in one part I was like, damn, I ate pretty good as a kid, you know, like shit. Um, but the other thing was like I, I went and spent time with my family because the recipes came easy to me, but the stories are what held this book together. And the stories of my ancestors, you know, going back to the museum with my grandmother, you know, I took a trip with my grandfather to Trinidad and Tobago and, and saw the canals and jumped over as a kid, went to his elementary school, he hadn't been to in 60 years, um, saw the beaches he used to sleep on in Tobago, but they didn't have a place to live. You know, and these stories just show me like how far I can go and you don't know, you know, you can't know like where you're going unless you know where you came from. And this book really showed me that. Can we start again? <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name is Jan. I work with an organization called Black Women for Wellness. We have a program called Kitchen Divas. Okay, okay, okay. And so our whole thing is about food is health, and how do we get healthy through food? So tell me your take on how do we get healthy through food, and give me that lens with a vegetarian lens also. Well, I got a meat eater lens on right now, so. I'm <laughs> <laughs> not messing with you. Um, I think food, I think people need to have a better relationship with food in general. You know, um, I think a, a, a main thing of what we do is Restaurants are entertaining for the most part. Unless you're actually feeding your community, you're not feeding people that are like actually hungry or need that. And I think um, 
once that flip switches, like you, you should have a better relationship with food. And us as people need to have a better relationship with meat in general. Um, because we eat too much meat. Like we don't need to be eating the amount of protein that we're eating. And you know, I'm a firm believer in like reducing terrorism where you know trying to reduce the amount of meat and the amount of meat in our diets because it's also just hurting our planet. You know, like all of these like factory farms and all these uh, cattle farms, they're destroying the environment, the rainforest, our water, um, our ozone layer, got like Jesus Christ, you know, like how much meat do we really need to eat? And I think if we look at it that, as at that perspective, do we really want to leave this planet better than how we found it? Then the other thing happens so as a byproduct.
we party. So we have like a block party, but you know, we'll have like a dish cup and I'll tell some jokes and you know, like 20 chefs like doing food stations and then we'll have an after party we're playing spades in the lobby until like 4 a.m. You know, in this like five star resort. It just feels it feels like home. You know, Drake's playing on the loudspeakers. It's, a, it's really amazing. So it's a four day food festival. Um, tickets are available now online. And uh, yeah, what's that? It's August 18th through the 21st. Uh, it's in Middleburg, Virginia.
I also, too, would love to have gun laws change. The end. <laughs>
that's where like excellence lives. It's when you really, really dive into it, not if, you're, if it's just like a hobby. Because at this point, there's a lot of people that are, that are doing it at, at a high level. So um, if you just if you just focus and, and go and start working at, at a restaurant, I think you'll be in a really great place. But this is the time. 14 is a really good age. So my name is Melania Lene. I'm here with my daughter, who's also an aspiring and becoming chef. And I wanted to ask the same question, but the question was answered. What would you tell an aspiring yeah. chef? Uh, or how you started? I know it started from the heart, for sure. A passion, um, or what? You know, how would a, a what would, how would a chef start? Um, just you start working. You know, just like at a restaurant so is a really good place to set your foundation. It is a lot of work, but I think that's always my answer, is like go into the hardest restaurant you can possibly work in, get your butt kicked, and you know, see if this is something that's really for you. And then you can always step back and like, do other things, but you have to build your foundation, and you don't have to go to culinary school, but you do need to work under people that really know what they're talking about, um, especially when you're in your infancy. So I'm 11 years old and I've been cooking with my dad since I was really little. Um, but I love cooking and I want to know how I could like keep that momentum going and not tire out from just like I love cooking, but how do you just keep going with that and follow out your passion with cooking? It's a great question. Um, I would say keep inspiring yourself in different ways. You know, there's so many mediums that you can like receive cooking. Like you can come to a, a, a talk like this, right? Like you can get a book. You can look on social media. You can watch TV shows. You can watch, you know, master classes. So I would say continue to immerse yourself in it. I think I started like really focusing on cooking when I was like your age, and I was watching probably more Food Network than Nickelodeon at one point. So like, just try to absorb it at, at, in any way possibly, any way possible that you can. Even if it means like going out to restaurants once a week, you know, in, in different types of restaurants and different types of cuisine that you're not familiar with. If you start to build your memory bank of dishes and food, by the time you're actually like a working chef, you'll have more to pull from than other people. Can we get a hand for this incredible We really hope that you'll engage the incredible recipes and stories within the book. Um, as I mentioned, a huge thank you to both Chef Aisha and Chef Kwame. Um, please follow both of them on social media. Keep up to date with their um, mini events. Um, please do grab a signed copy of the book available here. We'll queue up for also for a meet and greet with the chefs directly following. So hopefully you'll get to interact with them. And this, I mentioned the Mario Moore exhibition is also open. Um, it was so great having you all with us tonight. We hope to see you back with us in person very soon. If not, you're always welcome to catch us on our live stream on our YouTube page. Thank you so much and have a great night.